Welcome to The Simple Truth. I'm John Furnish, your Bible teacher. We've been looking at the book of Hebrews here the last several weeks, and, and we've named this particular study God's Heavenly Plans uh, or Orders. Um, and and I know that we, we, we haven't really talked too much about order of things, but today we're going to talk more about the order of, of what God is doing and, and bringing it out from Old Testament, New Testament, uh, as the writer of Hebrew brings it out to us. Uh, we're going to start in chapter 9, so if you've got your Bibles open, um, I read from the New King James um, that's where I study from, but, but if you've got an NIV or one of the other, uh, that's great. Have it open, read along with me, and, and listen to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you and me today out of His Word. So we're going to start at chapter 9, verse 1. And indeed, even the first covenant had ordinance of divine service and earthly sanctuary. So immediately in this chapter, we find that we're talking about the earthly um, Tabernacle that that and and it's not the temples we're talking about. We're talking about the tabernacle in the wilderness that was um, uh, the vision was given to Moses of of what was to be built and and the service that was to go on. Uh, it's, and it's a a type of what's in heaven. Uh, so we're talking about the earthly tabernacle and mainly, like I said, the. The tabernacle in the wilderness with the tents and, uh, and, and all that that went with that, um, that was transported uh, as they moved. Verse 2, for the tabernacle, tabernacle was prepared, the first part, in which was the lampstand, uh, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So the, he, he, he went past the curtain that surrounded uh, the tabernacle the, that was talked about, um, he's gone past where the, the uh, uh, curtain on the east end of it, where you could come into the, the outer court, you might saw it. Um, and there was a uh, brazing altar there for sacrifice. There was the laboring of washing that was there. Um, and then you came to a tent structure which uh, uh, he's talking about here, talking about the first room in that tent. It was divided into two particular rooms. Uh, they was a uh, shield, a, a, a um, robe in front of it, that, that tapestry that, that, so that you could walk into the priest. It wasn't the high priest. It was the, the general priest would minister in this particular room, uh, taking care of the the lamp candles, uh, making sure the you know the bread and, and and burning incense and and doing that. And they it wasn't one all the priests at once. They had uh, courses they did. In other words, they had times that they was to be there uh, and times that they weren't, so that they all ministered there at some point in time. Okay. Um, and in this first room, we have the lampstand, which is uh, the seven uh, candles that was, was burning uh, pure olive oil in it. There was seven of them on the middle, um, three on one side, three on the other side, and then the one in the middle. Uh, and then there was the, the table <clears throat> that had the showbread on it, and there was 12 um, loaves of showbread, and they were in a square uh, there was two stacks of them. There was six on one side and six on the other side. And this was a representation of the, of the 12 tribes of Israel that were uh, there. And we call this first room the sanctuary. Uh, and then verse 3, behind the second veil, and it, we're talking about between the two rooms, uh, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Alls, or, or what we commonly call the Holy of, of Holies, um, it is where God's presence was. That's where they believed his presence was at all times. Um, <clears throat> in this room, verse 4, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid with all sides with gold, and with a golden pot that had manna, uh, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablet of the of covenant. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And above it were the cherubims of the glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. 
of these we cannot now speak in detail because we're, when we was in Israel, um, I asked, you know, what did the Ark of the Covenant look like? And, uh, and basically they can give you a general description, but they're not, they, they don't know exactly now how the, the cherubims were set, um, was set up there, but it, they were over the mercy seat. Um, but when you go back, the golden censer that was there, um, the Ark of the Covenant, which, which was a, um, about a three by three uh, box, and it was about um, five foot long. Uh, so, uh, and it was of Acadia wood, you'll find that in the Old Testament, uh, and it was overlaid inside and out with gold. And inside that box was um, a golden bowl that had manna, that, that the manna from heaven that, that God provided for the Israelites when they were in the wilderness, um, when they came out of uh, Egypt. And, and he provided food for them. And I know most of you probably know that story where, you know, <clears throat> five days uh, they got enough for them. It, it didn't matter whether they gathered a little or whether they gathered a lot. It was, it was enough for them for that day, for that family. And then on the sixth day it was twice as much and it would last for the seventh day. God's provision showing us there uh, of how he provides for us. Uh, especially when we're in the wilderness uh, of our lives. Um, it also showed Aaron's rod that budded. Uh, there was a dispute about whether Aaron should be the high priest or not uh, back uh, when he was anointed to be high priest. And so each tribe, the elders' tribe, brought a staff and they laid it in the, the <clears throat> before the altar uh, that they had built, and the next morning when they went to look, Aaron's rod not only had budded, but had produced fruit. So they knew then that God had chosen Aaron's rod and chosen Aaron to be the high priest. Um, just a, a small outline of what was going on with that. <clears throat> and then we have uh, the mercy seat that's set on top of this um, the Ark of the Covenant with the um, golden cherubims that were uh, over it. Uh, <clears throat> we've lost what that really looked like, what, how they were. Uh, I've seen cases where they both was overshadowing. I've seen a case where it looked like they was back toward the, the back a little bit and the, their wings were touching in the back but not in the front where you could actually maybe sit down on it. <clears throat> but they believed that God's presence was there. And so uh, we go on <clears throat> talking about this earthly tabernacle that, that uh, the writer's talking about. Now verse 6, now these things have been uh, thus prepared. The priests always went in the first part of the tabernacle and performed the services. So here we have the first part going back to the sanctuary that we talked about first where the, the uh, uh, candlestick, the, the incense, and the showbread were all in, <clears throat> and they ministered there every day. And there was a set of priests at certain times that would be there so many days, and, and then, then they would come out, and then the next set would be there. Um, I thought it was interesting that the showbread was there for, for a week, and then new bread would be brought in, and that bread that was been there for a week was given to the priests to share among them. Uh, always, God is always providing, you know, a bit of Himself in in a sense to us always as as we go through. And He's showing us all these things in the earthly tabernacle the, that was built. Those things all typify our heavenly tabernacle that, that God built, not man. And we see the priesthood is servicing there. Okay, <clears throat> But verse 7, but the second part, and that's the Holy of Holies we were talking about, the, as, as the writer here calls the, the Holy of All. Uh, but in the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, 
which he'd offered for himself and the people's sin, committing in ignorance. So um, we see that on the Day of Atonement, that only the high priest could go into this second room, the Holy of Holies, and he couldn't go in without blood because, because the blood would need to be the covering or the testimony of a sacrifice that needed to be done. Uh, and, and he did that. You notice that part of that verse it says, which he offered for himself and for the peoples committed in ignorance. In other words, this was not for the forgiving of, of uh, eternal sin that, that we would, but you notice he had to sacrifice a sin offering for himself and for the people. And that's important to note as we go through here. Uh, and it was for the ignorance of, of committing sin, those sins that we didn't know we committed. Uh, in verse 8, the Holy Spirit indicated this, that the way into the holy of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle still stood. So, <clears throat> so what was being pictured here by the Holy Spirit and God himself telling us was that uh, the holy of all was not yet available for you and I to walk into. <clears throat> it was a restricted place. And that <clears throat> as long as the perfect sacrifice had not been given yet, this was the ordinance that was set up. And it was always to, to remind us that <clears throat> what was being done was not good enough it was only um, acceptable at the time, okay? But it didn't take away sin. It always kept us conscious of sin that would be committed. And so there was always this symbolic going on with this. Um, verse 9, uh, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot uh, make him who performed the service perfect in regards to the to the conscious, concerning only with food and drink, various washings and fleshy ordinance imposed until the time of reformation. And now, what he said, all this, all the, the rituals and ceremonies that was being performed in the Old Testament, both the gifts and the sacrifices uh, were being done, and it was only taking care of the outside. It was not an inward uh, changing. It was the outward appearance, the outward change. It was in obedience of doing these outward things uh, that we was being showed during the Old Testament so that it would be a type of what Christ would do in the time that he would come. So you notice that, that in verse 10 it said, you know, it concerned about the food drink, various washings, uh, uh, and fleshly ordinance imposed until the time of reformation or until the, the time that the second covenant would come in. Always it was, it was trying to point out that this was just taking care of the outside, outward uh, uh, illusion that we have uh, to, to think we could be holy uh, and it, that there would be a time coming when this would be done away with. It's really pointing to a time when Jesus would die for our sins and that a new covenant would be brought in and the old covenant would pass away. But the, new, the old covenant was something that was teaching us what would be done in the spirit realm on the inward man at a certain time, not yet happening yet. But here we're looking back uh, before Christ to what was going on, why they was doing these things. Now, in verse 11, 
we change the scene here from the earthly tabernacle to start bringing in the heavenly sanctuary that, that Christ is over now. Verse 11, but Christ came as high priest of good things to come with the great and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. See, everything in the Old Testament tabernacle was made from material things that were here on earth. Okay, it was made by men being uh, um, in, endowed with with certain talents to make these things, and that all these things were earthly, and that's why it was it was the earthly temple that we that's been talking about. But Jesus is the high priest of good things to come. In other words, what the Old Testament covenant could not do. Jesus is, is the mediator of the new covenant that is able to change us, is able to make us uh, to be, and, I, and I, I say that in the idea of, of washing us with the word to make us holy, to lead us into being holy, um, and, and with our choice to, to accept that and follow through. Uh, so it's a lot, it's a better because it, will bring us salvation where the Old Testament, please understand that in the Old Testament when they did the sacrifices it was to remind them of sin it didn't take it away it only in a sense backed it up rolled it back when the high priest went in once a year on atonement day and, and the sacrifice uh, that was being made and, and the blood sprinkling that was being done to sanctify all, our sins were rolled back. But we'll find out what Jesus did here in just a, just a, a little bit. Verse 12, not with the blood of goats and, and calves, but with his own blood, he entered into the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So you see, Jesus went into the tabernacle. After his death, he took his own blood into the heavenly tabernacle that was made by God, not man, and presented it uh, in the most holy place or in the Holy of Holies that in, in the Old Testament, High priest could only go in once a year, but Jesus is the high priest that allows us to go in anytime and every time. And now, instead of it being pushed back, our sins, they are redeemed. They are paid for. They are taken away from us because of what Christ has done. And that you and I need to accept him as our Savior and ask him to forgive us of our sins to receive that forgiveness. But we have to ask for it. Now, let's go on. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of, heifer, of a heifer sprinkled the unclean, the sanctified for the purity of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? Cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So here again, we're talking about what Jesus has done um, from his own blood. He can't it, and to the holy host, not with the blood of bulls and goats and, and, and the ashes of the red heifer uh, that it talks about in the Old Testament, part of the ceremony, um, sprinkling the clean and, and sanctifying, purified the flesh. So see, we see here in the Old Testament, uh, they sacrificed, they had to voluntarily sacrifice a bull or a goat. Um, and and they used the blood and and water and ashes from from a totally burnt red heifer that was that had to be uh, perfect uh, and they used that and they put it on a a, a hyssop with a with, with a uh, red or scarlet uh, 
uh, cloth on it and they would dip it into it and then they would sprinkle out across. And in the Old Testament, uh, when Moses read the laws and the ordinance that needed to be done, uh, he sprinkled not only the book but also the people. You know, and, and so we have that, that first covenant was um, sanctified by the blood. And so here we see that Christ has done the same thing, but his blood speaks far more of an animal, and he's not in the earthly tabernacle, but in the heavenly. If, if Jesus would have, would have served in the tabernacle on earth, he would have had to been a Levite, and he came from the tribe of Judah. That's why we call him the Lion of Judah. So he wouldn't even been a priest in, in the Old Testament, but God has called him to be a high priest because of, of what he has done. And he not only was willing to bring an animal to the sacrifice himself. And that speaks to you and I, that when we come to the Lord and we ask for forgiveness, we ought to be willing to, to be that living sacrifice that Paul talks about in Romans, uh, to be a living sacrifice. Uh, no longer am I living, but Christ through me. Uh, so we need to be a volunteer, as Christ was. Christ volunteered to go to the cross and die for our salvation for the, for the uh, covering of all sins, and not only covering them, but forgetting them all through the ages. And so <clears throat> we should be willing, volunteer, to be that living sacrifice, to live for Christ as he's lived for us and died for us, that we would go to eternity, and, and if, at some time we're going to die, that we'd be faithful in that, all the way to our own deaths, whenever that would be. Uh, I don't encourage you to, to try to get in a hurry to do that. I don't, because there's things that need to be done here now. We, there's people that need to be blessed, and we need to be into that. Uh, <clears throat> notice that in verse 14, it says, offered himself without spot to God. Now, in the Old Testament, they would watch the sacrificial lamb for a week so that they made sure that they wasn't a limp. Uh, they, it was a perfect sacrifice, that there was nothing wrong with it, um, and everything was right for it to be the atonement lamb, the sacrifice lamb. Well, uh, Jesus came into Jerusalem uh, the week before the crucifixion, and he was seen by the priest and, and, and was found... You know, uh, though they didn't like him and didn't agree with what he was doing, uh, he was without spot. In other words, he was without sin. His life was without sin. Uh, his teachings was, was uh, how to cover sins and to be repentive of those things and telling us of God's uh, uh, character that he was living in front of us. And, and that's how he became a high priest, by being obedient to the plan that the God the Father had set for Christ. Now, he said that this was, he had to be a, a mediator. Here we're talking about wills, in a sense. that uh, I don't know where you have one. I have one. My wife has one. Um, I hope you have a will that says that when you die, this is what you want done with your possessions. That piece of paper isn't worth anything until the one who had it written up dies. Then it comes into force. Before that, it has no power until the one dies. Here's what we're talking about with Jesus. He is the mediator of the new covenant. In other words, his testament, his will came into effect when he died, but, in, but where we have uh, saw an executor to take care of our will after we've passed on, he is the executor of the new covenant. He is the one implementing and seeing that the New Testament covenant is in place. 
okay, uh, which is to bring us an eternal inheritance. And, and the main thing there is eternal salvation. Not only are we spiritually going to be saved, but we will be physically uh, saved also. There will be, there'll be a, a uh, new body that we'll receive. Now, uh, verse 16, for where there is a testament, there must be a necessary to be a death of the tester. That's what I've been talking about for a will. Uh, for a testament is enforced after the men are dead, since it has no power at all while the tester lives. And there again, it has no power as long as, as, long as the one that made the will is alive. Well, we know that Jesus was the... Uh, the testament, he was the tester of this, of the new covenant. Now, verse 18, uh, therefore not even the first covenant was, was dedicated without blood. Now, this is a little, little it, the way it's written, it kind of throws me off. But what he's saying is, because the first covenant had to be dedicated with the blood, the second covenant needs to be initiated with blood or dedicated with blood. And so the blood of Christ was that, that dedicated uh, that you and I now, when we accept Christ as our Savior, we are covered by the blood of Christ spiritually. Okay, We're not being poured blood all over us uh, in a physical sense. Uh, we are being sprinkled with blood. We are covered with the blood of Christ in a spiritual sense. Because we have come under his covenant and not of the world. So as we look at these, and we'll look at it a little deeper next week, know that through Christ, he not only was the testament, tester of the will of the new covenant, but he is implementing the new covenant to you and I as we live our days. Has he been a, a willing sacrifice for you and I? We should be a willing, living sacrifice for Jesus Christ. If you know him, you can do it. If you don't know him, I suggest today, accept him as your Savior. Knows that he loves you. Knows that it is the best thing for you. It is the most important question that you'll ever answer. Will you serve Christ or will you not? I pray today that you serve Christ and that you continue and you be encouraged by these programs and by your pastor and other people that, that encourage you in the, in the walk of our faith. Continue in faith. God loves you. I love you. We'll see you next week.